Well, there is a lot yet still to happen here, Harry. Let's talk about this militarily for a while. It's so significant to have uh, these U.S. forces in Baghdad as we speak. There have been some firefights, even significant fighting on the northeast uh, part of town, but there is so much of this war yet to be fought, especially up around uh, Kirkuk and in, in Mosul, the oil fields up in Kirkuk. Isn't it suspected that uh, those oil fields may already be uh, set up to be sabotaged? The belief is that they are already uh, wired for demolition. Uh, everybody talks about the tipping point. Uh, when uh, the Iraqi people finally decide that it is safe to switch sides here, abandon Saddam Hussein, and come over to the American or coalition side. And that seems to be happening, at least in the neighborhoods we can see on television uh, in Baghdad. Uh, but up north, uh, which is uh, sort of Saddam's home territory where his clan is uh, based, uh, it remains very much to be seen whether those people are going to uh, come over to the American side. There may uh, simply be a given number of people uh, who are simply going to fight to the bitter end. We do not know uh, where all those 15 to 20,000 members of the Special Republican Guard are. They seem to have... Uh, melted away along with the regime leaders, uh, they're out there somewhere and they're going to have to be dealt with. So many people have so much at stake in this regime and it has been clear since this war started three weeks ago that plenty of them have been willing to fight to the death to to hang on to what they've, uh, what, what they've been a part of for, for more than 20 years now. And in a way you have to uh, uh, respect the courage of some of these fighters. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, young men with uh, no military equipment other than uh, uh, automatic rifles and, and rocket-propelled grenade launchers, and they're taking on uh, tanks coming down the street at them. Mm. And it's, it's a battle they, they must know they can't win, but uh, uh, presumably their, their hatred of the United States or their, their stake in uh, the regime is so great that they have to take these just incredibly desperate measures. All right, David Martin at the Pentagon, we will be checking back in with you a little bit later on. We want to go to John Roberts now, who has been with uh, the Marines uh, right on the outskirts of Baghdad, a little bit farther into the city, and now back at a, at a safer position now. Uh, we've got a night scope on him now, and John, uh, what can you tell us about what your day was like? Well, Harry, there seems to still be a lot of resistance in the eastern sections of Baghdad. Uh, not necessarily heavy resistance, not necessarily organized resistance, but it's a lot of these uh, imported fighters, the militia members, the Fedi, and that David Martin was talking about. Most of the resistance that they're meeting is in the form of machine gun attacks or rocket-propelled grenade attacks. They step out from behind a building, they try to take a lucky shot, see if they can hit something. They try to pin down the Marines, they try to harass them with fire, they try to mix it up for them, make their lives is difficult. Uh, these are people that the Marines are particularly worried about because they say, as David Martin pointed out, the special Republican Guard members, some of the Republican Guard members, and the regular military seems to have just sort of melded into the background, it evaporated, as one uh, Marine commander told me. But he said that these particular people, these militia members, the Fedi and the Jihadists, have lo no loyalty to anyone in particular, uh, probably not even Saddam Hussein, uh, they're here simply to try to kill Americans. So, so routing them from the suburbs of Baghdad is going to be very difficult. And of course, the suburbs, this house-to-house -house, uh, uh, area that uh, they've engaged uh, the Marines in, is an area where they thrive. You know, they can't be out in the open desert and try to face a, an invading Marine or Army force. They've got to bring them into the city and, and, and do it that way. So the Marines are saying, while you're looking at all of the pictures of what's happening in downtown Baghdad, you're seeing that the statue of Saddam Hussein come down, you're seeing people cheering in the streets, don't be fooled by that because this battle is not over yet. It still could take a couple to three more days before they finally suppress all that resistance there. There's another concern, though, going forward as well, and that is that this, this war is unlike anything that we've ever seen before in, in terms of the, the swiftness of it, in terms of hopscotching and bypassing a lot of centers or moving through them quickly and then leaving sort of the, 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 the jelly to fill in behind after they've gone through. But as they do that, that creates a vacuum of power in some of these smaller towns like Kalatsakar to the south, uh, Numania to the southeast of here. Uh, and the problems in some of those cities goes like this. 
the Marines worked together with the local elders, local village elders, to try to find out where the Ba'ath Party members were, those people who were loyal to Saddam, uh, where the arms caches were, try to get rid of the machine guns, the mortars, the rocket-propelled grenades so that they could make the city safe and, uh, as a matter of, of, of secondary uh, effect, make the Marines safe from the rear that they wouldn't be counterattacked. Well, they've gone through there, they've talked with these village elders, they've uncovered these weapons caches, they've got rid of the Ba'ath Party members, and then as, as they leave and then that jelly folds in behind them, the Ba'athists move back in and they again try to take over the village. In, in one small village outside of, of Kalat Sakar, exactly that happened about uh, 10 days ago. They got the weapons, they got the Ba'ath Party, everybody uh, left, everyone was happy in the village, and then what happens, the Marines left, they jumped up to the next town, the Ba'ath Party came back in, and they assassinated the very village elder who had helped out the Marines. In a town just to the southeast of here, Azazia, a local councilman by the uh, name of Malik Kreif wrote a letter to U.S. military leaders saying, please don't leave us behind, please provide security because we're afraid that these bad guys will come back into the city and then the nightmare will start all over again. In cities like Umkasar and in uh, Basra, there is a plan to provide security. But in many of these small towns and villages, there aren't. So, Harry, there could be a potential situation here that Baghdad will fall, the regime will crumble, the U.S. military will be essentially in control of the country, yet may have to go back and refight some of the battles that it's already won. John Roberts uh, on the outskirts of Baghdad uh, this evening. Thanks very much. We want to check in with Dan Rather now, who uh, went back in country uh, several days ago over the weekend, has been in and out of Iraq and uh, right, uh, right up close to, close to the action. He's back in Kuwait City now. And Dan, this has been one extraordinary day to, uh, to witness what we have witnessed there in the heart of downtown Baghdad over the last uh, three hours or so. The Marines rolling right in and, uh, and lassoing that statue and uh, seeing it pulled down. It was quite, uh, it's been quite an amazing day. Very interested in your reflections on, 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 on your thoughts right now. Well, first of all, Harry, there's no question uh, that this is a great day for American military power, a great day for the American people, in that while certainly there are people uh, who oppose the war and still have deep concerns about it, that once the nation got committed to war, the question was, whether we had the firepower, the willpower, and the staying power to topple Saddam Hussein's regime. And while certainly one has to hold out uh, the prospect as unbecoming as it may be to say that there's probably some blood still ahead, still some fighting ahead, what happens in Tikrit, what happens in Mosul. But for the moment, the concentration in Baghdad, but I keep reminding myself, Harry, that this strike, this lightning strike, this deep maneuver by the U.S. military, uh, it has proved that America has the power and the will to effect a change in a distant land. And that has far-reaching ramifications, the likes of which we can't quite figure out yet. There's no question it's a great day. It's, by the way, among other things, uh, that it gives justification to the General Tommy Franks, who's been criticized by an awful lot of people along the way, uh, that his war plan, his battle plan, to bypass a lot of southern Iraq cities and go straight to the heart of the Saddam Hussein regime with speed and flexibility, uh, what we're seeing today demonstrates uh, the planning and the wisdom of that. The same could be said of Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and, for that matter, the Commander-in-Chief, President Bush. Mm -hmm. I know there will be people who sigh and say, well, it isn't over yet. And indeed, it isn't over yet. But you, one uh, must give credit where credit is due. President Bush, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, the Army Commander on scene, uh, the Commander here in the region, General Tommy Franks. Uh, when you see these pictures, uh, this resulted from a combination of firepower, willpower, planning is a whole U.S. military, a whole new U.S. military that affected uh, what you're seeing today on the screen. Uh, it's the military of the digital age and the information age, mm. it, which isn't to say that this can be effective and successful everywhere, anywhere in the world. But what you're seeing today is proof positive that for at least the time being, it's been very successful here. 
Dan, we've got uh, some pictures now that uh, were shot earlier today of uh, the Marines uh, literally putting a chain around the neck of the uh, statue of Saddam Hussein. They dragged out the old Iraqi flag, the uh, pre-Saddam Hussein Iraqi flag, and it was a U.S. tank fixer with a chain around the neck that pulled away, and the, the, the statue slowly fell. It was bent. It was bowed, and eventually it was uh, broken off of, uh, off of the pedestal. It was uh, an amazing, an amazing scene. Uh, you were just in Baghdad weeks ago and talked at length with Saddam Hussein, who uh, vowed not to be broken by this conflict. Uh, your thoughts on, on if, in fact, he's still alive, what, uh, what must be going through his mind, what's th going through his psyche right now? Well, of course, Harry, no one knows whether Saddam Hussein is still alive. Uh, no one knows if he is alive, if he's wounded, or how badly he's wounded. The hard fact is we simply don't know what has happened to Saddam Hussein. And another hard fact is that until and unless it's determined what has happened to Saddam Hussein, that he's dead, he's badly wounded, uh, it's going to be very hard to declare the ultimate triumph and victory uh, in Iraq in the eyes of many people, uh, particularly in what we call the Arab world, which is an overgeneralization, but for these purposes, the Arab world, and for that matter, throughout Islam. Uh, but it's still early on. Uh, I repeat for emphasis, nobody simply knows what's happened to Saddam Hussein. There are all kinds of theories, and besides those that he's dead or he's badly wounded, uh, some uh, theories are that he has made his way uh, to Syria, perhaps wounded. But this kind of speculation doesn't help us very much. Uh, we always come back to that rock hard uh, fact that nobody knows what's happened to Saddam Hussein. But in many important ways, Harry, there's no question that the Battle of Baghdad is the decisive pivot point uh, in this campaign. While always, again, emphasizing it's a redundancy, but I think it's worth taking time to remind ourselves there can be a lot of tough fighting still ahead. And it was mentioned earlier in the program that could very well take the form of the United States military having to loop back into some portions of southern Iraq and refight some of the battles uh, that were sort of scattered and in pockets on the way up, because that could be in the nature of guerrilla war. Of course, uh, General Tommy Franks and his planners will already be have an eye on that and have some ideas once they bring the 4th Infantry Division up to reinforce, if you will, in the southern part of the country. But this is simply to say that there still could be a, a guerrilla war ahead. But these scenes today uh, are something to be savored for all who work so hard to make it happen. It was a, a stunning uh, situation. We were on the air earlier today, Dan, uh, uh, live in New York. It was about 8.45, and suddenly we had pictures of just this column of uh, M1A1 tanks. We're literally looking down the barrel of the tanks as they rolled right into this very familiar square, uh, this uh, traffic circle where this huge statue of uh, Saddam is. And in the entire time that we had the picture up, I think we're talking about over three and a half hours, I think we heard three single shots fired there in, in that area. Not so far away over at the oil ministry, these are all places you well know. Uh, Byron Pitts was with the Marines and well pinned down for some time there by, by fire. And I think uh, one of the things that can't be emphasized enough is how just how volatile and how potentially dangerous uh, the situation for U.S. forces that are in Baghdad will continue to be, especially in these night hours to come. Dan Rather is uh, with us in Kuwait. Uh, he was with uh, some of the uh, Army Special Forces in, in the last day or so. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about just the tenacity and the planning and the power that's gone into uh, this amazing uh, blitz across the Iraqi uh, countryside and the, uh, and the, and the uh, taking of downtown Baghdad today. We're looking at pictures now, Dan, of, uh, of Iraqis who found a sledgehammer. And they were literally one by one 
uh, taking their their shots at the at the pedestal of the of the of the statue, and each one sort of getting a lick in, as it were. But uh, it's still worth emphasizing. It seems to me that he has had so much control over the people of this country. And uh, would you not agree that there are still people who are very wary of what uh, the future might hold there? Well, on a day like today, Harry, the pictures speak so strongly for themselves. And it's a time to sort of stand back, sit back, uh, look at what's happening, and try to think it through against the backdrop Against a, in a context that reminds us uh, that Iraq is an extremely complicated country in its mixture, its, uh, its ethnic mixture with the Kurds in the north, the Sunnis uh, in mostly the central, upper central part of the country, the Shiites predominating in the southern part of the country. No one can know, of course, but one would, by any reasonable analysis, have to think that Many, if not most, of these people celebrating in Baghdad are uh, Shias. Baghdad has between five and six million population. Uh, the Shiite population has been variously estimated in anything from 40 to over 50 percent. And of course, Saddam Hussein being a Sunni Muslim, uh, the Shiites, who are a majority in the country, certainly a plurality in the country, uh, always seized under the fact that, that Saddam Hussein, among other things, punished them so severely, so viciously and fiercely uh, in the wake of the first Gulf War, Gulf War I, when uh, the United States has acknowledged that it basically abandoned the Shiites who had been encouraged to revolt against uh, Saddam Hussein and his Sunni regime. So all of that is in the background. It's, it, it requires, it's a very textured context against which we're seeing these uh, scenes of jubilation today. But this much we do know, that those who analyzed the situation in Iraq and said there's a, uh, a, an enormous pent-up rage against what Saddam Hussein has done to the country and done to a lot of people in the country, uh, they've been vindicated in that analysis today because unquestionably, uh, finally, the volcano of concern from below it was sort of waiting to see whether the Americans were indeed, the American-led force was indeed going to topple the Saddam Hussein regime. Uh, whatever has happened to Saddam Hussein, his regime, his regime is finished, as President Bush promised that it would be. Mm -hmm. And so this explosion from below uh, is all coming to the surface now in Baghdad. As I say, there may be tough days ahead uh, and other fighting, particularly up north. Uh, but on this day, you see what we were looking for on the first days of the campaign. Mark Phillips and I were talking the other night saying, well, you know, in Basra, they thought there was going to be an almost immediate sense of liberation and people pouring into the streets. That didn't happen. They waited for a while to see what was going to be the effect uh, of the American-led force in the country. And it turns out that was very much the case in Baghdad as, as well, that for a long time, people just stayed in their houses. They watched, they looked, they listened. They kept the, the children sort of out of sight, waiting to see what was happened. But once they realized that the U.S. Army coming from the south and, and went west primarily, and the Marines coming from the south and east and even from the north were connecting, and once the police and the military disappeared from the streets of Baghdad, then the rumble from below uh, exploded forth in what we're seeing here now. I would say, Harry, that there is a question in my mind that the police and the soldiers disappeared. Where to where did they disappear is an open question at the time being and one we might ponder. Indeed, and if, uh, if they've disappeared uh, and run uh, like rats from a sink sinking ship, or if they've disappeared to regroup and fight again. We'll uh, talk about that some more in a bit. Dan Rather is with us uh, live in Kuwait City. We want you to stand by right there, Dan. We've got lots more to talk about, but we want to revisit a situation that uh, what happened uh, that really started uh, just over four hours ago as U.S. Marines and uh, coalition forces rolled right into downtown Baghdad. It was quite an extraordinary scene, right into the middle of the city, surrounded a statue of Saddam Hussein, but not so far away from what was a 
peaceful situation was uh, the oil ministry where other marines were pinned down and our byron pitts cbs news correspondent byron pitts was on the scene and this is what it was like just a little over an hour ago okay you can hear that that's incoming fire a flare just went up. That's an indication that the Marine that spotted where this fire is coming from and a sign from the Marines here where they may aim. This is the most intense fire that we've heard during this battle. Mark, get down, please, folks. This is my colleague, Mark Kulaganga, who's up taking pictures. Uh, as this fight goes on, uh, it's just about sunset. That loud explosion. What do we think that was, sir? Uh, those Marines firing back. It was Byron Pitts a little bit earlier uh, today in Baghdad. As we saw those uh, U.S. tanks rolling into Baghdad, it was not all easy. Stephen Black is a former U.N. weapons inspector and a CBS News consultant. He is uh, with us in Washington. Stephen, you've spent so much time over in Iraq and in Baghdad. Uh, your reflections on what you've uh, been watching uh, thus far today. Well, Harry, it's just an amazing thing to see that statue of Saddam toppled over like that. I used to stay in the hotel there across the street from the Palestine and, you know, wake up every morning and see that statue. And now to see tanks there and the, the Iraqi people beating on the statue, is, it's a phenomenal thing to see. Yeah, it was amazing. At one point, uh, people were taking off their shoes. And uh, if you're looking for a symbol of disrespect in that part of the world, to take off your shoes and to wail away on something, as some of those folks were doing, there is uh, no higher insult than, uh, than, than what those folks were doing uh, earlier this afternoon. Of course, the, the question remains, uh, Stephen, you know, you were over there looking for weapons of mass destruction uh, in your time as a weapons inspector. We've had had all of these uh, signs and uh, symbols and, and, and places where uh, Iraqis have said, look over here, look over there, look at these giant drums filled with who knows what. Uh, thus far, no positive signs of WMD. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we have to keep in mind that this is something that the regime has been hiding for years from the U.N. inspectors who are roaming all over the country, you know, day in and day out. So it's going to take some time to actually put our hands on it. The, the citizens pointing the way to the weapon stocks, that's going to be the solution. But you have to remember, of course, that not everybody in Iraq knows where the weapons are hidden. So a lot of these locals are just going to point the way towards suspect sites or places where they noticed funny things going on. They'll each, in turn, have to be checked and investigated as possible weapons hide sites. Talk a little bit about the Iraqi people to spend that much time in Baghdad. You get the opportunity to meet folks. Some are reluctant to talk. Many won't talk at all. But this is a, a fragile fabric there with these folks who who are really, you know, have been under this boot so long, it's, it's very difficult for them to come out and embrace whatever is happening next. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, you know, what we're seeing here is just how fragile a, a repressive structure based on fear can be. Once that level of repressive fear and concern for, you know, your personal safety starts to lift, you start to have people out in the streets taking these, you know, rather obvious actions against Saddam's regime, even against the memory of it. And right now there may be only hundreds or maybe, a, a, you know, a short thousand people in the streets, but there are probably ten times that many that are sitting at home hearing the rumors about what's going on, basically being happy, mm. but not yet willing to go out in the streets. Because we should emphasize that Iraqi television and radio has been off, uh, off the air for more than a day now. So it's not as if uh, people in, in Baghdad proper in a city of five million people are watching this or even listening to it on the radio. They really don't know what's going on. And in these neighborhoods, the people who are tied into the Ba'athist regime or tied into Saddam Hussein's power, as they go home, the people who are celebrating there, they may be going home to a neighborhood where they literally don't know 
if their if their neighbor is with the liberation or still hanging on to the power from the regime and is a danger to them yeah the people are going to be making some pretty complicated decisions for themselves about whether they want to be obviously involved in in this uprising or if you know if they want to take these kinds of actions where they're on camera but the the uh, movement in the streets here, mm -hmm. the rumors about it will spread far and wide very, very quickly. quickly. Stephen Black, thank you so much. You're watching Thanks. continuing CBS coverage of America. <laughs> Welcome back to CBS uh, News World headquarters in New York, one o'clock Eastern time. It's uh, now. Let's see, uh, about four hours since uh, U.S. tanks uh, rolled into uh, downtown Baghdad. An amazing uh, scene earlier today, big M1A1 tanks. These American uh, forces uh, popped out of the top there. They're not, they're keeping their eyes open. They're looking for, for snipers. They had their binoculars out, as you could see. But uh, honestly, in the, in the time that these guys rolled into town, we heard one, two, maybe three shots over a period of uh, three or four hours. Um, it was it, it, an amazing morning, an amazing thing uh, to witness. Uh, earlier today, uh, they took up their positions around a, a famous, fabled uh, statue, giant statue of uh, Saddam Hussein. It was really, literally smack dab in the middle of town. There they are on armored personnel carriers. Here's a, here's an. A, a, M1A1 tank, and there's the statue. And after a while, civilians started to come out in this, out into the street. And uh, I thought Mark Phillips uh, down in Kuwait, who has spent so much time in Baghdad, said it best. He was talking about how what you're seeing is one thing, and what you're not seeing is something else altogether. There was a, a small crowd of uh, several dozen to begin with who, who came out. They were waving their shirts and and shouting some slogans and whatnot. Uh, this a very muted celebration here in the center of Baghdad. The dozen turned into, you know, several scores of people. They eventually uh, put a, a rope noose around the neck of, uh, of the statue. Uh, one of the uh, locals there brought out a sledgehammer, and people literally, through the morning hours, took turns slashing away at this uh, statue of Saddam Hussein. And uh, then the U.S. forces brought in what is essentially a, a tank tow truck. It's a tank fixer. And the Marine uh, put up a, an American flag. It was only up there for, you know, maybe uh, 60 seconds or so, two minutes at, at the most. Uh, the U.S. forces have gotten in some trouble with the locals for uh, brandishing the flag. But then an Iraqi, an Iraqi held the flag. That might be one of the pictures of the day. Eventually, the folks from this uh, tank fixer dragged out this huge chain, this iron chain, wrapped it around the uh, neck of the, uh, of the statue. That's an old Iraqi flag, uh, 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 a flag that Saddam Hussein did away with uh, 15 years ago or so. And then the old Iraqi fla flag is put around the neck of the uh, statue of uh, Saddam Hussein. And then the, uh, then the tug of war uh, came in earnest. Uh, the statue was no match for the marine uh, uh, horsepower there. And as you watch the, the bronze figure uh, fall over and uh, eventually look at the crowd just en engulfed the statue. And uh, it didn't take much of a tug or two after that for the uh, statue to fall all the way. They're throwing debris. They're throwing rocks. There's, uh, there it is, all the way to the ground. And then, as our Lara Logan, who is on the scene, reported, uh, jubilation, uh, people uh, just screaming, down with, uh, down with Saddam, down with Saddam. And uh, a real spontaneous uh, celebration took place. And then this, another picture of the day. There is the head of Saddam with uh, an Iraqi citizen uh, sitting right there on his skull being dragged down the street right down the street just an amazing an amazing scene senator joan uh, biden is uh, with us he's a member of the senate's uh, foreign relations committee senator it's uh, been an amazing morning to say the least uh, some of your thoughts as you've watched this scene unfold there in baghdad today 
Uh, the, one of the reasons I voted to allow the president the authority to do this was I believed that not only uh, he had w weapons of mass destruction, but that the people of Iraq really were being victimized in the extreme. And I think this is proof, uh, at least in Baghdad, and I think you'll see it around the country as it becomes clear the wicked witch is dead, that, uh, uh, that the Iraqi people desperately uh, look for a new life. And uh, now, the, now the next part uh, comes into play, Harry, and I hope we're able to do as well on this next bit of diplomacy and nation building as what we were able to do in toppling Saddam Hussein. I know the job's not completely finished yet, but, but it seems there, there is an absolute inevitability, obvious to the whole world now. Winning the peace is uh, what uh, seems to be the order of the day, at least in terms of the conversation yes. of the day. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about what you think that's going to entail, because this, this could be very, very complicated. Well, it will be complicated. We knew that going in, Harry. Um, and it's going to require the United States be in charge and maintain the security of Iraq for some time to come in the near term. My hope is we can bring NATO in uh, to work with us under the, uh, the umbrella of the U.S. Uh, um, uh, being in control. And then we have the problem of uh, not only securing the nation and c can stopping uh, retribution killings, which would be instinctively follow here because of the long history of the division and the abuse of, of uh, the Shia and the Kurds. Um, we have to, in addition to that, uh, get to on the, the business of rebuilding Iraq, the roads, the bridges, the television stations, the radio stations, as well as um, the transition to a new government. And in that score, on those issues, I hope we do it as well as we did the military side and internationalize it more, have a coalition that is even larger, that in fact gives the legitimacy to whomever the transition government here is, like we did internationally under our leadership in Bonn, Germany, in setting up Mr. Karzai and the transitional government in Afghanistan. We were the main player, but the rest of the world, NATO, the UN, the EU, uh, the, uh, uh, er, er, the, just everyone was involved in that. And I think that it needs legitimacy, this new government, because mm -hmm. our purpose here is to provide for a transition government that results in a more democratic Iraq that is a peaceful and, uh, and contributing neighbor in the neighborhood. But thus far, the Bush administration doesn't seem terribly inclined to uh, go along with the notion that you just outlined. Well, I think that's, that, that, that seems to be true. Uh, um, but uh, Brent Scowcroft, for example, the former national security advisor under the first President Bush, speaking to the Nobel Committee on another matter today, uh, um, laid out how important he thought internationalizing this was. The Secretary of State feels strongly about that. The military feels. Now, the more conservative elements of the administration, led by Mr. Cheney and Rumsfeld, uh, apparently do not. Uh, but I hope the president uh, will, uh, um, will, in fact, understand the wisdom, understand sounds presumptuous, will, will, will see the wisdom of uh, having a government that is legitimate from the beginning, and that is impossible to occur even within Iraq if it appears to be a hand-picked government by the United States. So I, uh, the battle for the president's decision is not over yet. Um, Senators Luger and Hagel, leading Republicans, uh, myself, a Democrat, a lot of us share the view that there's a need to internationalize this now without giving up one scintilla of control of the security apparatus. Understood. Senator Joe Biden in Washington, thanks so much for uh, being with us. And of course, this uh, is a, almost a little bit of a premature conversation, considering the fact that uh, there is a good portion of uh, Iraq that is still not in coalition control. And uh, up north in, in Erbil, uh, up in the uh, uh, Kurdish control zone up there is our Alan Pizzi and uh, Alan it's been quite a day because as soon as it became evident uh, even up there that uh, US forces uh, had uh, uh, gotten a serious foothold and control in Baghdad uh, things really erupted up there didn't they? Harry they literally erupted the people here just hit the streets they began firing guns in the air at random it's a traditional Kurdish way of celebrating so there was a lot of falling lead around here then they were out in their cars buses trucks waving flags from the various political parties waving uh, 
the old uh, long ago Kurdish flag from 1946, screaming and shouting and hurling curses at Saddam Hussein, curses that are unprintable. But the Kurds have every reason to curse Saddam. They were his biggest victims along with the Shiites, but the Kurds were the people who were gassed by Saddam Hussein in 1988. During the Operation Anfal in the late 80s, the, he came in here and uh, his forces smashed over 4,000 Kurdish villages. I mean, smashed them to pulp. And then they displaced hundreds of thousands of Kurds, killed hundreds of thousands more. And the war up here is not yet over because the two key areas, Mosul and Kirkuk, the big oil producing areas, lie just south of here. The Kurds consider that part of their homeland and those areas are not secured. Indeed, Iraqi forces have been pulling back from the front lines that were here, pulling back towards Mosul and Kirkuk. Um, we just don't know what's there. There were a lot of Iraqi armored divisions around them originally. Now this morning, the Kurdish uh, pol political leader, the spokesman here for this political leader said that the Kurds along with U.S. Special Forces had captured a key mountain overlooking the city of Mosul. And they said the way was open for them and they did not believe they faced any resistance. On a couple of other front lines as well, we've been talking to both special forces and Kurdish commanders. They all say they've had a, a quiet couple of days and we asked them, well, why aren't you moving in? And they say, well, there's no point taking casualties if you don't have to. And I think the policy up here has been to harass and squeeze, squeeze, squeeze the, 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 uh, the Iraqi defenders of Mosul and Kirkuk, hoping that when things fall apart in Baghdad, so too they will fall apart in Mosul and Kirkuk. But if they don't, and the Americans and the Kurds have to go in against them, it's going to be not quite as easy, perhaps, as the run-up from the south was, because there's no armor up here. The 173rd Airborne came into an airport in Kurdish-controlled areas uh, about a week or so ago, but they've only just begun bringing in a few Abrams tanks and some, um, some fighting vehicles. They are flying them in, so you can only bring in one at a time in a C-17. So there's not a lot of armor to go up against whatever is in Mosul and Kirkuk. What they're doing at the moment is pushing forward as the Iraqis pull back. Then the U.S. Special Forces are spotting targets, calling in airstrikes, and hoping that the Iraqis will be worn down and give up. But as I say, it's been a quiet couple of days. Just before we came on air, we heard...